Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to uh, welcome you to this morning's presentation. It's a uh, real pleasure uh, to be able to uh, introduce Dr. John Petch, uh, who is with the UK Met Office. Uh, John is the head of Met Office Science Partnerships. And in that role, he is responsible for the Met Office's uh, national and international relationships and agreements. And in that context, we've had a, a good first day of discussions, uh, as I mentioned in Julia's presentation yesterday, having John and Julia here talking about the many ways I, I think in which we can work together uh, on topics of mutual interest. So it's great to have them here. It's great to have John here as the lead in that role. In addition to that very significant management role, John is also very well known for his research, and he continues to carry out research uh, in the general area of atmospheric processes and parameter, parameters, why can I say this, parameterizations in uh, global and uh, regional atmospheric models. Uh, work that he's been doing since he was actually here at NCAR as a visiting scientist in the mid-1990s before he joined the Met Office in 1997. Uh, it, with his science hat on in the Met Office, he's managed the cloud and radiation team as well as the convection modeling team uh, with a focus really to ensure that all the different versions of the unified model, from the very high resolution versions used for short-term forecasting to the versions used for global multi-decadal climate variability and climate change experiments, have the best possible representation of, of clouds, microphysics, radiation, and the like. Finally, I just wanted to mention that on the international stage, John also plays a couple of very important roles in the research community. The first is that he is co-chair of the Global Atmospheric System Studies, which is a panel under GWEX, one of the core programs of the World Climate Research Program. Uh, that panel oversees the modeling and prediction activities in the GWEX program, primarily by coordinating scientific projects that bring together international experts involved in the development of atmospheric models. And somewhat similarly, John is also a member of WIGNI, and perhaps you uh, have uh, known him in that role. WIGNI is the International Working Group on Numerical Experimentation, which has the responsibility of fostering the development of atmospheric circulation models for use in uh, weather and climate prediction. So again, it's a great pleasure to uh, have John with us today, and I'm very pleased that he's uh, here to give a seminar on developing a seamless modeling system in partnership. So, John? Thank you, Jim. That's uh, by far the longest introduction I've ever had, so uh, I've, I've got something to live. In fact, I've got two things to live up to. I'm not normally nervous giving talks, but I'm following right on the back of Julia's talk, which is a little bit of a hard thing to follow. And now I've had the longest introduction that I've ever had. So I'll, I'll see what I can do. It's, it's, a, it's something of a, a bimodal or a sort of hybrid talk, this, because of the two roles that I've been involved in recently. Uh, there's, a kind of, there's a combination of our partnerships and how we try and build them. But I've tried to sort of tie that in with some model development we work and how it more practically goes in. You'll see that one or two slides when I'm trying to explain how we build this for the people who were here yesterday, which I guess most people were, look rather a lot like Julia's slides. Uh, I, I, my challenge there is to say a few different words around them. I, I thought it was really useful to define seamless modeling from, from, a, from a Met Office perspective. I, these are my words, so, so Julie could easily choose different ones, but because um, because people have different ideas, and when you when you begin to develop a model, it's really important to think exactly what you mean by this. Is it is everything exactly the same? And for a seamless model, what 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 we really mean here, as far as I'm concerned, is a consistent approach to tackle a range of problems, and with this modeling system only having traceable differences. And by by traceable, I, I'm talking about things that are deliberate and justifiable differences given the problems that you're addressing. And I think that's what we mean by a, a seamless modeling system. And it's, it's seamless across forecast lead time from days, hours, days to centuries, and seamless across spatial scales from convective scales and even higher resolution LES through to the coarser global scales. And we have um, one modeling system to tackle that. So that was before I even say what I'm going to talk about. So, this is a bit that overlaps a little bit, but it gives you the context of model development. So, you know, 
much of our model development is, is very much top, what I describe as top down rather than bottom up. Bottom up would be where you have a brilliant idea about a process that you want to get into the model to, to make it better. Top down would be where you identify your key model problems, then try and have a brilliant idea to tackle them. Uh, and it's just a way of prioritizing what you're working on. And so for our different models, we, we always have a, you know, at any one point we can pull up a top 10 list of things that we really ought to be looking to improve. Uh, and we'll have one of those for, for the very global models and, and another set for regional, and there'll be links between them, basically. <coughs> I'm going to say how we use partnerships to, to, to tackle this once I've shown how we use things. And then talk a little bit about model evaluation and development. And the examples I've actually chosen there, so they're the ones where we're delving into a bit more detail. And I'm not entirely sure I'll have time to talk about both either, but just a little bit on the MJO or, or and a little bit on the continental warm bias or the US warm bias as we often talk about it, although like it, it's both northern hemisphere continents that we see. Um, and my summary is very short because the talk's a bit bimodal. So Julia showed this yesterday. And you know, the, the, modeling, the point of this is the modeling system is used right through uh, present, right through to climate, multi -deca uh, decadal and, and centennial prediction. Um, and these are the sort of usages that, that Julia talked about. I just want to highlight one thing on this, which is I think is quite interesting and, and I haven't thought really hard about, but probably ought to think harder, more hard about, is that if you think about where model development occurs and in terms of identifying the issues and looking at the impact of the changes of the things that we're working on, it happens here and here, in the clever climate re and in the hours to week. So we look at error growth and then we look at the full long climate simulations it's quite difficult to work in this, this. This is kind of what they call the sweet spot. This is, this is the area that everyone's interested in. There's lots of people that need to know at different levels the weather on these kind of time scales. However, because the runs are, partly because the runs are expensive, partly because it's complicated, there's a lot of ensemble members and you're removing biases and background things. It's quite a challenging area to actually contribute to model development. This is a slightly more detailed version of something Ju Julia showed yesterday. So these are kind of our operational forecasting models from right through to seasonal, basically. So we have the one and a half kilometer. It's 36 hour lead time, it's run eight times a day. So this is a little bit more detail than you got yesterday. Um, the regional model runs over here, is run out four times a day to different lead times. We don't believe that going beyond 36 hours is especially useful for the convective scale model because it's giving you detail after 36 hours a large scale synoptic pattern is probably not where you want to and but the four kilometer model gives you a bit of detail on that that you might be interested in there's ensembles of all these different ones the global model Julie said the end of the year but we're actually it's actually running now the 17 kilometer model it's running in parallel for the next few but we've got about three more weeks to go and then that's going to be fully operational and all the products will come off that um, Again, these are run out uh, two, two different lead times to twice a day, and the ensemble products as well are at a somewhat lower resolution. The seasonals there. The seasonal is a coupled modeling system. The, these uh, are not coupled at the moment, but that's the, in, in the strategy are two things that's worth mentioning going forward. One is that this global model will be coupled right from the, right from go uh, as, as we go forward, because we think that that's ultimately where we need to be. And there's already evidence that having a coupled system, even in the shorter range, is, is valuable. The other thing is, as we get a slightly bigger computer, um, and you, I think you only mentioned this yesterday, the, 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 the money we've got for that, we're looking to be able to run all these every hour. Um, so we're not waiting. And that's, that's almost driven by the forecasting, a review of how the forecasters work. And the forecasters, at the moment, are co constantly waiting around for the next model run and there might be a jump in the model runs and things like that and we want to change that behavior we want the forecasters to be using what they have now and be able to see the evolution of the forecast and the fresher the forecast the better they can do that so we're looking to be going to hourly runs of these these models um, the other point that, that's really important actually is that, that these models can be quickly we already run some of these models either at, at re resolutions around this in various other parts of the globe where interesting things are happening as far as uh, defense issues are concerned or for other reasons basically but it's very rapidly relocatable up to anywhere and 
we've just finished for the second year now running the 2.2 kilometer model, not an ensemble, but the 2.2 kilometer over the whole of the US for the severe weather test bed that NOAA run. And so there's been some interesting results from that. And we've got two, two years worth now. This is the kind of detail we're getting out of the weather forecasting that we saw yesterday. Some of it's right, some of it's wrong. An important thing then to begin to think about ensembles. These are the kind of statistics that we get. And this is a paper that Julia talked about yesterday by uh, Lizzie Kendon. It's totally different what I'm showing here, actually. So here's winter, but I'm just showing the difference between a one and a half and a 12 kilometer regional model. And what you see is in winter, there's little difference between a 12 kilometer and one and a half kilometer model. And that's because the precipitation, what, what this is plotting actually is the, the change in heavy rainfall in future climate uh, in the upper 5%, so the, the upper 5% of the extreme, looking at the extreme of rainfall, this is the actual change in the rain rate. Uh, so that's five millimeters per hour, that's half a millimeter per hour. And through winter in a future climate, the closest Clapeyron type response of a one to two millimeters per hour. If you look at um, summer, however, the 12 kilometers showing a similar kind of response, uh, even some, some, some strange coastal effects down here. However, we're seeing of order of five, up to five millimeters, so this super response that Julia talked about, that isn't picked up in a 12 kilometer model where you parameterize convection. And I think that's a really important point for, for kind of regional modeling when you're thinking about extremes. That's not to say that a different model wouldn't have a different response there, but that's, that's the response we see in this one. Global models are getting higher and higher resolution. Why are we running a, you know, why are we nesting down and running different, different models? Well. We improve this. This is, this is a kind of a, a percentage improvement on an index score. There's lots of things in here, but it's basically lots of surface variables that measure the objectively measure the performance of the modeling system. And uh, this is for the last uh, few years. What it what it's effectively telling you? These are just different averages, time averaging of the same lines, basically. But what it's effectively telling you is that the uh, one and a half kilometer model over the UK is adding about a five to ten around a 10% improvement on the index, basically. So that's, that's, that's what you get from having that increased detail. There's some verification is really important in this. And when you add extra detail, you need to begin to think about the, the location of things. Uh, and, and you have to do some fairly clever um, some uh, objective analysis, basically, to work out whether it's right, neighborhood methods and things, so that you're not, otherwise you get this thing called the double penalty. But when you allow for that, you're seeing around this 10% increase. That's the equivalent of about 10 years research and computer increase um, on, on the system. So that's why it's so important to us to, to run these, these regional models as well. In the context, I just want to, so Julia talked about it. I've got extra pictures, but we've still got big waves. We've still got trees coming down, and there's those idiots again. Um, the, the, these were just the winds, so you can see the high winds that we were getting. That was a wave plot Julia showed. And these, these are the actual monthly rainfall for uh, December and January. And you see, particularly over the southern Britain, these sort of 200% increases. And it was, it was a kind of record winter. I'm telling you this more from my perspective, just to, uh, and, and we saw this. And from a, again, from a verification perspective, this is a radar. This is the, the model. You know, some, some of the details right, some of the details wrong. So how do we do a verification that's capturing that actually there's a lot of realism in this, this modeling simulation? And I think there's a real piece of work still to be done on, on working out how and when we're improving these models and when we're not. And I don't, we're certainly not there um, because the amount of sampling, particularly because it's extreme weather that you care about, the amount of sampling and the amount of runs you really need to do whether, to see whether a model changes genuinely improves something is, is, is vast. And I don't know whether we know the answer to that yet, but it's, it's something that really we need to begin to collaborate on with our partners, basically. Of course, when, when you start using the ensembles, that becomes a little bit better. So this was, this was a, a very wet day where there was some serious flooding over Wales. Um, and whenever we communicate our forecast now, it's not about what the weather's doing. It's about the impact that that weather's going to have. And that's what our operational meteorologists are there to do. Um, so 
if there's a large amount of rain in one region and a large amount of region in the in another, if that one's not having any impact, they won't raise the issue about it. In this case, there's valleys, steep valleys in this region, a vast amount of rain. This is a 24-hour accumulation from rainfall of between, uh, well, around 100 millimetres, 120 millimetres. But what they do is, the forecasters like to communicate now, we have this forecasting matrix, and it's a likelihood against the impact. This red warning is the thing that Julia talked about that makes a prime minister involved. So he doesn't go out very often. If you put that red out, he has to form a COBRA meeting. So they happen once a few times a year, basically, at most, once or twice. Uh, so you need to be very, very sure of yourself to, to, to set those things going. But it's all about communicating this impact, there's risk to life, and how likely it is. And for here, we put out a red warning. And that was using the ensembles, and this shows us the value of the ensembles. Because when you've got these convective scale ensembles, this was able to tell us the probability it involves neighbourhood methods again, as well as combining all the ensemble members. It allows you to get the probability of exceeding certain precip precipitation thresholds, whichever one you think are leading to the high impact. So you might say 32 millimetres is going to cause X problems. Here's a probability in the region where we think we're going to exceed that. You can do the same thing at 64. And then 100 millimetres is a very serious event that we might want a red warning for, particularly in this region because of the steep valleys and where it flows out. And there we're seeing an 80, 90% chance of that. And that's sufficient to engage the red warning, basically. Same thing, we never went red with this one. But this was a high winds through this winter. These are just postage stamps of all the ensemble members at 2.2 kilometers. And these are the wind, wind gusts. Uh, and what we basically found was these ensemble members had very, very high gusts. So th this had been forecast very long time in advance, uh, right from basically about five to eight days out, eight days using the European Centre model, and then five days, which is our key forecasting range. Uh, and then these ensembles then began to pick up that actually the high winds were, were coming from something that's a little sting jet-like, or actually uh, another type of uh, gust on the southern flank. So there were different realisations of the same thing, giving high impact weather from different ways. Um, and so this was remained as an amber warning because we've only got about half the ensemble members there, but the impact was going to be very high. And so that was communicated. This is going to be a potentially very high impact event. However, we don't have quite as high certainty. Um, it turned out to be that some of these high winds, one of these realizations was fairly quite right. It was very windy in London, and London gets impacted by things because they're, they're very soft there. Um, <coughs> And so they had to shut down the whole transport system and things. So, and that's, that's what I'm talking about by this impact forecasting. So it's not about what the model's telling you. And this, this, this communicating of the uncertainty is really, really important. And, and, it's, you know, and we need to apply this to understanding how we want to do our modeling and how we develop the model. Um, here's another example of our website where, and this is the same event from earlier. So this is from five days ahead. So I'll show you it from closer. And already at that point, we were highlighting this as potentially high Im impact, but low likelihood, which is what I was just saying before. But how do we communicate that? Well, it involved tweeting descriptions about we weren't quite sure where the system was going. We had this on our web page explaining the tracks, different tracks that could occur, and words around it saying what the likely impact of that was. And even on the BBC weather forecast, they were showing the different potential tracks and trying to explain to the public there was a risk, but it depended on what happened, and we weren't sure. We don't use probabilities to explain that, but we, our forecasters explain it in, in, in that kind of way. OK, so that's what we do. A bit of weather, a bit of climate. So what about our science partnerships and building this model, basically? Well, from what we just said, it's a big demanding list for the model developer. We want the model to add value from hours to centuries, local, regional, global information, ensemble forecasting, DA is clearly critical. Everything boils down to the HPC constraining what we can do. Otherwise, life would be easy, I think. Um, so we need to run a range of horizontal grid lens. Uh, when you think about Earth system modeling, I didn't talk much about that. We need increased complexity. Uh, as you go forward. And that's what I'm talking about by a traceable difference as well. We will run with ocean biogeochemistry when we look at our centennial runs to, to look at the carbon cycle and things. However, 
Uh, we might not do that in our forecast, and you know, we've got good reasons for having that difference in the modeling system, and that's a traceable difference in a seamless system. Um, many challenges uh, for developing all the different components. I'm going to focus on the atmosphere. I'm more familiar, but this cuts across lots of different things. And I think that's why I see, and, and Julia would say, one center cannot tackle this alone. It's just too big a list. We have some various national and international partnerships. An important one for us is our UN partnerships. These are operational users in other countries that use the model for their work, and we look after that. And obviously, we learn a lot from them. Uh, we have relationships with the universities, with the research. This is actually quite unique. You'd think this would be standard in most countries, but actually, it's rather unique to have a reasonably good relationship with the research councils. Uh, and we, we have a joint aircraft and things like this. And if you look around the world at the number of national MET services, but the, particularly the ones that do quite a lot of research, like we do, that have a good relationship with their research councils, you tend not to find them. But yeah, it seems like the obvious thing to do, basically. Um, we work on international development, and we, work, we learn a lot about our modeling system from those activities, uh, as well as the likes of NCAR and lots of other people that we, we just want to do good science with to, to, to get into the modeling system. And it's, it's my role to, kind of, to, to, to look after these, these areas. I'll just touch on them quickly, the types of things we, we work on. So these are the operational users of our model as, as, as of the moment. So New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, uh, India, the national NTRMWF, the medium range forecasting in India, the Koreans, and I was in Nebraska last week, it's uh, at Omaha, and the US Air Force uh, use our model to drive WARF. Um, from these, from people doing that, so why, why, you know, it's not a community model, uh, and, and these users, they, they pay a support fee for us to, 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 to look after the relationship, basically, and make sure the infrastructure works. Not, not a great deal, um, but but what's in it? What, why, why do we do that? Well, you know, we we learn a lot from working together. We have joint uh, process evaluation groups. Some of them, these top ten problems I was talking about. Some of them are led by the Indians on the monsoon. Some of them are led by the Australians on the maritime continent, and we work together to tackle those. And that's the real value of the UN partnerships for us. We have workshops on the areas that we're interested in. We run tutorials, and some of these. Uh, are investing jointly in our technical infrastructure. And so we, we, we have a project running where each of us puts four FTEs into it, four people per year. And so we have a group of 16 instead of a group of four from just the Met Office to, to build on some of the technical aspects of the model. Also, you know, people can take the model for free and run it in research mode. That's, that's a fact. So we give it out to the universities and things. Uh, and I mentioned the capacity building as well. Our relationship with the uh, NERC, the Natural Environment Research Council, we call JWCRP, the Joint Weather and Climate Research Program. We do joint science together. Again, these are projects where we jointly invest in uh, activities between the two centres. We have the Earth System, the next Earth System model. So, if people are familiar with HADGEM 2 ES, which went into uh, AR5, we're acknowledging now the really huge importance of the research centers, the National Oceanographic Center, who developed the ocean model and other areas. And it's the new, the new name, look out for UK ESM1 in, in the next uh, AR, AR6, basically. That's our, that's our model name. Because it's not just the Met Office model, it's our partnership model. UK Environmental Prediction Model, this is, this is work that Julie briefly mentioned yesterday to try and couple together some of the uh, river routing and uh, air quality. Our next dynamical core has been, that's a big task, We're going from a, a lat long grid to a cube sphere grid, that, that's uh, uh, been developed in, in, in partnership with the Research Council and various universities, and very high resolution modelling from, from the, this thing called Upscale, uh, where we and Julie showed the slides, I've got them all jumped past them, but the, the, the impact of that. We also operate a joint HPC, which allows us to share data, really important component of that, but also to share the same runs of the model, and we operate an aircraft together with the Research Council. They all fit into that JWCRP program. There are four universities in the academic partnership. We do things like supporting professors, 
We have case students where we pay for PhDs. We give out undergraduate prizes. Um, and we, that basically allows us to coordinate. We, we pay for a joint chair in the university as well. We pay for a professor. And part of the role is we have committees with these universities where they try and pull through and coordinate themselves to tackle the problems that we have. Uh, a really important part of our re relationship, this, and we, we get a lot from it. And as Julia mentioned, the, there's about three million from this, but all our joint projects gear about 15 million uh, pounds into, into what we're doing. Um, just some other numbers here. Our papers basically uh, have been last year's example, or tw nearly two years ago now. There's about 440 institutes across 41 countries. So although we coordinate partnerships, there's lots of people working with lots of people. And I don't, as a, as a partnership manager, I don't fiddle with that. <laughs> they, they get on with it. The, th the work that we do, the work that I do, is, is to coordinate some of these bigger, more strategic projects. We're not, fiddling, we're not stopping people from working together and, and you know, I, I don't have an oversight of all these 41 countries and all those people. The other thing is we really encourage our staff to be involved in various committees. Uh, as I say, I, I co-chair GAS, and I'll be touching on that briefly in a, a brief moment. Um, and, and the other international partnerships I've touched on already. So you saw, you saw that yesterday, but I just highlighting, you know, this work was done, the work to look at next generation resolutions for climate, so the atmosphere and the next one, which is the ocean. This was done by NCAS, which is part of our GWCRP relationship and was uh, jointly resourced. And this one was done by the National Oceanographic Centre, which is also part of GWCRP, and again, jointly resourced. And so these studies into the impacts of resolution are not just being done by the Met Office. Julia started this when she was at the university, and it's part, partly a JWCP and an academic partnership activity. But it was to run very, very high resolution. I'm twiddling the globe around there just so you can see that it's quite a big area. And so these are one and a half kilometer simulations over a large area for a, a reasonably long time to try and understand the, the scale growth of convection and things. And um, we learned a lot about our modeling system as well as, well, probably more about our modeling system than convective interaction at this point. But we really want to take the next step with with this now, and so that's just an example with the academic partnerships. And that's just, so if you just zoom in on that little area, what looks like a little area there with not much detail, that's just a snapshot of that area and the types of things that we're seeing from uh, our sort of quite large domain, one and a half kilometer simulations over Africa. And we tried to take that information, and, and there's been quite a bit of work looking at the role of the diurnal cycle on the propagation of the uh, West African monsoon from this, and it's provided, proved uh, some really, the, so, and that's been done by our partners as well. So that paper was led by John Marsham, who was at Leeds University. <coughs> In terms of the international development, we, this is, uh, there was a quite big typhoon went through the Philippines, and we were, we were working with the Philippines at the time and operationally running our high resolution model in that region actually at four kilometers so that we could have a reasonably large domain at this stage. This is back in November. Uh, and we could see, when we originally ran our model in that area, it, it wasn't very good. And the tropical cyclone depths were, were, were far from realistic. And I've got another slide to show on this. But what the model we were running at the time, because we'd optimized it and learned things already, was predicting regions of about cumulative precipitation in 12 hours of about 250 mil from this tropical cyclone. This is the global model with a very poor central pressure. This is, you can see all the isobars stacked in here. And this central pressure was about 900 millibars, which was very close to the observations. Uh, and, and that cumulative precipitation actually wasn't a bad match either. These are just some preliminary data from NOAA, Project NOAA, which is in the Philippines. And this is an animation of the uh, four kilometer model. So it's just a little, it's, it's not resolving it very well. And some of the convection looks a bit funny because it's a four kilometer model. But you can see the detail it's giving in capturing the tropical cyclone eye and things. And we're learning a lot about the model from those simulations. And, and well, within that work, just to touch on model development a little bit, you know, the types of things we were looking at with, that, with this partnership were around the sort of boundary layer, the mixing scheme that we included in, in our convective scale model, as well as the dynamical core to understand it and comparing it to the global model of course, one, one, one simulation is not sufficient, so that took us on to do various bits of work to look at a range of tropical cyclones, real ones, where we've got the central pressures in the black here, and then various different modeling simulations uh, to, to understand their behavior. And you can see, you know, 
already, this comes back to verification and understanding things. We've got one where they are, all the models are over-egging the tropical cyclone central pressure. So a kind of false alarm from the model here. Other ones where lots of the models are doing quite a good job and then one's doing a, a bad job. And there's a lot of information there to try and begin to piece together, basically. Um, but it's important to get these misses in. If you just go around and choose exciting tropical cyclones and simulate them, you're not going to pick up on things like this where you'd be issuing a false alarm to, to the people in that region. Uh, so lots of work there, and that, that work's going on in, in partnership with Pegasa, which is the Met Service of the Philippines. Gas. That's boring slide. Gas. The concept of gas has been for a long time, and it came out of GCSS, and, and Mitch, who sat here, was, was, was fundamental in, in, in the building of this activity quite, quite, quite some time ago now. Uh, and I've been involved for quite, quite some time as well. Since I was at NCAR, I've been in, involved in gas, so maybe I should stop. Um, but the concept, it, it's been expanded quite a bit since, since I, I became co-chair um, to really do a lot more global forecasting, uh, essentially, rather than it started around here doing these LESs and single column modeling, uh, pulling in a few observations. Now there's a lot more focus on bringing the observations into this. There's much more around uh, limited area models. I differentiate those from CRMs just in terms of these tended to be idealized and have cyclic boundary conditions and things, and these tend to sit in an analysis or a global model, but the physics is kind of the same, really, but there's things to learn from that. Uh, and then there was work drifting into sort of looking at things like cloud feedback and the understanding of physics in the climate change scenario. So that's what, that's what gas does. I have two <coughs> sets of things on gas that have come out of gas recently. That I was going to share, which really sort of beginning to pin down into understanding physical processes. Um, I'll try and go through them both fairly quickly. So, because there's a nice story about the MGO, uh, there's something called the MGO Task Force, which sits under Wigney or, or, or somewhere like that. I get confused sometimes where all these committees sit, but uh, they came and said, Whereabouts? They said, Oh, we want to, we're really interested in. The MGO, the dynamical processes of the NGO now. We really want to get to the bottom of you know, the, the sloping heating structures and things and the importance of that. And we know a gas look at the physical processes. How, how can we work together? Can you, if we do some 20 year climate simulations, which is our plan, and look at the MGO in them, can, can we work with you to do the analysis of the MGO physical processes? To which, to which I went, yes, but. And, and, and my but was basically. If you look at a model that hasn't got an MJO and look at the diabatic heating profiles of a model without an NJO, then you have the, the physical tendencies of a model without an MJO. And if you've got an MJO, then you've got something that, but, but it's not going to tell you very much. It's just going to tell you you didn't have an MJO. And so what, what we agreed on in the end was a three component experiment. So it grew a bit, uh, where we would run 20 year climate simulations as they suggested originally and look at the fidelity of the MJO and the vertical structures. But then this, these were the bits that were added. We, we, we were running a 20-day hindcast, essentially, of various cases of the MJO. And this is using the Yahtzee analysis, basically, uh, looking at three hourly data of all the physical tendencies, but in particular, focusing on the, uh, the evolution of the diabatic processes. So how does the MJO evolve in the 20 days through the forecast? Does it disappear? Does it stay? Uh, and then this one. I got a bit carried away, actually. I, I, I probably got a bit overly carried away. I said, oh, well, we want every, every physical process on every model level, on every time step, on every grid point, without <laughs> actually working out what amount of data that was going to generate. <laughs> Fortunately, you know, uh, JPL uh, uh, have got a big server, and we've got many, many terabytes of data from the model now, uh, and some really interesting things about time step by time step behavior of, of the physical processes. Uh, but this, so this, but we only looked out, went out to two days, focused on a small region, and basically hammered everything out of the model. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on: hammering everything out of the model. But first of all, I'll just talk about the. That's not animating. Drat! It was yesterday. Um, this, this, if it was running and, and animating, was quite fun because it was a, it was the evolution of the MJO in different models compared to the observations, basically. And what we had down here was the, it, it was fun because it was an animation in lead time. And what, what you saw was how these 
these um, diabetic tendencies evolve through the forecast lead time. Uh, but I will skip over that now because it's not going. And just focus on the two-day hanker. So the status of this project is that the papers are in a kind of draft form, essentially. Uh, and this is the, the high resolution one on Prince Xavier from the Met Office. He was actually based in Singapore at the moment. So another one of our partnerships. And it's, it's, it's a good place to look at the MJO. So quite quite happy with that. Uh, it, it's leading on this activity. And this, these are the dates up here. These are two of the, M, the Yotsi MJO cases. But we focus, this, this basically highlights the region we're looking at. And it goes from a sort of suppressed through to an active phase of the MJO in, in, in that region. And, and so you can collapse that down. Just look at the bottom of the first. This is case one. This is case two. And these are the 12 to, piecing together the 12 to 36 hour lead time of the forecasts. And we've got all these different models involved. In, and we've got the trim, the combined trim Yahtzee analysis of what that, that thinks the rainfall is in, in black. Uh, and you can begin to say, I'm not going to go into the details of all the different models here. NCAO are involved with this, so we've got results from them. The Met Office model is involved in this. Um, but you can see a reasonable spread in the very an active phase. So we define them as the convective or the active, the transition and the suppressed phase of the MGO for these regions. And we chose 12 to 36 hours based on this. This is a com combination of both those periods throughout, throughout the entire time, looking at the evolution of the uh, forecast as a function of the forecast lead time. So you piece them all together. And, and what we can see is that there's differences in here. And there's quite a bit of noise in, in, in this, this red one here, which is the Met Office model, which we're, we're trying to tackle. But there's some spin up around here where, where the models, they, they run from the European Center analysis. And you don't want to be right next to the analysis to look at the physical processes. But you do want to be fairly close to it, the analysis to be constraining the dynamics and see what the physical processes are doing. There's no right answer to this, but about 12 to 36 hours is a good lead time to, to, to look at this over. And then you can begin to see how things are behaving. I'm, I'm going to drift out a bit beyond two days for a second, but these are the, the, all the models, and I'm not going to differentiate models here. The dashed lines uh, are the, uh, coming from the uh, anal uh, analysis. And the, this is just a model spread, the total model spread, not, not like the standard deviation, but the spread of all the models. And so 12 to 36 hours. I would argue that we are constraining the dynamics. There's quite, you know, there's a fair amount of spread, but we can see the convection here, the transition here, and the suppressed period here. And the multi, the, actually, the multi-model means, which are these single lines, do a fairly good job. Perhaps not quite so good with the transition, actually, but do a fairly good job. You can still see the the convection separated out. The suppressed and transition are disappearing at a five-day lead time. And as we go to seven and twelve days. It's, you know, we have no longer got coherence of the MJO in this region. So that, in fact, you know, we can simply say that actually at seven days, none of the models have got the, the, the active phase of the MJO. Uh, one of the interesting things that we're going to do with this now is at this lead time, it could be just the MJO is missing it as you've gone to a longer lead time, or the energy could be going out of the model. So what we're going to go and do is look at everywhere and see whether there is something that looks like the MJO somewhere and we're just missing it, or whether it actually the models are losing energy. And I think that's a really important question to try and pick up on for, for how things are going with that. The other thing that we're hoping that isn't too big, but we might learn something from it, so it's a kind of circular, circular argument slightly, are the biases in the model. So these are the, the temperature biases, the big black line. So that, again, the multi-model means doing a fairly decent job. We're going out to plus or minus 4k here. But there's beginning to see big spread across the models. Again, I think this, this red line here might be the UN, which has got quite a big cold bias aloft, which I, I think we're aware of and, and, and looking into. Again, the mo moisture bias, the multi-model means are, are doing a fairly good job, but you can see the spread around this. And what you can't do with these, particularly when you, these model comparisons, is make any really, really wise statements about physics. That's not what they're there for. It's really important to understand this. What this is there for is so that people in the Met Office are looking at this very, very close, they can go away and put their results into the context of other people's. So I tell you that because if anyone reviews the paper, you know, I'm not trying to make some wise science statements. We're saying this is a benchmark case. It's really important for people to do the model development work. It needs to be out there in the literature. But actually, we're not going to try and say many wise things about all the different model differences. Convection's kind of all over the place in terms of convective mass flux that I'm showing down here. Um, 
there's a, there's a line on here that, that's from the analysis, but that's just a physics scheme, so you wouldn't believe that. So there's very little to verify this with still. One of the next stages is to kind of look at the um, Cindy Dynamo case, where there are a few more observations and we might be able to pin down. And another step will be to, to, to look at the thing. This is, this is interesting to me. So uh, clouds and radiation I've done quite a bit over the last few years. Um, and my, my, my summary of this slide is clouds and radiation are all over the place. They're all over the place 20 years ago and they're all over the place now. They're just still rubbish. And we really, you know, if you want to choose something to, to, to sort of really tackle, let's have a look at this. This is, this is the total radiative heating from all the models, basically. We could look at the heating from the mass flux as they all look a bit similar. There are still a lot of spread, and the, the absolute spread might be larger, but you know, look at the fractional spread of the models here. Uh, they're not agreeing on sign in the total radiative heating anywhere. Uh, you know, if, if you believe that clouds and radiation are somewhat important for climate and climate change and cloud forcing, then you know, where does that leave us with, with this kind of result? 36 hours out from the analysis. This isn't a dynamical problem. It's not a massive dynamical problem. This is telling you that with the dynamics constraint, we can't do clouds and radiation. I'm going to pause there, making a big statement. And it, you know, it's particularly the ice is important. I'll carry on now. You know, the, the ice is all over the place. These are the fractions, and these are the water contents. Fractions are all over the place. Water contents are all over the place. Liquid water is all over the place. Sort it out. Another thing that I haven't shown details of here is, is actually, though, that there's, you know, one of the things we've discovered is that there's very little link between the models with a good hindcast and those with a good climate. Um, so from the long runs, but this, this isn't necessarily what we're expecting. From the 20-day runs, you can see who's, lo who's losing the MJO. Uh, and NCAR has got the best maintenance of the MJO at 20 days. Um, it, it, it's, it's the best model. Look at the climate run. There's nothing in there with the version of the model that's been run for this. And this, this is another challenge because you know, part of the seamless concept is that often the models at short, the areas at short range are um, you know, tied to the areas at long range. And they may well be in this as well, but it's obviously in a much more complicated way than the next thing I'll talk about, which is the warm bias. Uh, <coughs> basically, I've said that. So if time, I've got about five, a quick bit on the warm bias, I've got, yeah. So we have another project called Causes. Clouds above the United States and areas at the surface. This, this is just um, also been led out of the Met Office and, and worked with uh, some people from PCMDI, essentially, in, in the first instance of building it, although it's going to become a multi-model comparison. It's kind of motivated by this, which is the, this is from AR5, probably, maybe three, who cares, it didn't change. Um, these are the temperature biases. So you're talking about five degree biases in average across all the models that are involved in AR5 the present day. It's a bit rubbish as well, isn't it? Um, common to many GCMs. So then the first step of seamless systems is, well, what's it look like in the short range forecast? This is from the UM perspective. This is the seasonal variation of this at a five day forecast. So this is where the US is, if you're not familiar. Um, <laughs> March, April, May, then in summer, here it is. It's about of order three degrees. Three of the, I think it goes to about seven in our model six in, in the climate run. It's kind of about halfway there. What, what, are the, what are the, Kelvin, yeah, what, what other units are there for temperature? <laughs> oh, we're in America, yeah. <laughs> we have these things called SI units in, in that we try and use in Europe, which, and most of the rest of the world, actually. <laughs> and it's still, it's still persisting a little around, you know, in the autumn or fall, if we're going to talk American. And you can I'll just highlight, you can see it over the Central Asia as well there. Um, but largest in summer. So yes, it's in the short range. So what's this project doing? It's basically taking uh, something from the atmospheric science research uh, um, MC3E campaign, which was in spring, when this bias is growing, um, running NWP models over, a, again, a 48-hour range, taking the 12 to 36, so a little bit like the MJO case, uh, but trying to take the water out of the models, the water content out of the models, 
and compare those against the, the radar that's available from the ARM site. So we're, we're trying to track down where, where this one base is coming from. Is it the clouds? Is it the dry land? I've heard, you know, people have said, oh, it's definitely the clouds, but we've, we've, we've seen evidence that the land and the land surface scheme are important in this. It's clear that the energy balance needs any of the components in the energy balance. Um, so, so which one? So we've been running at about M512, around 30 kilometer grid length in this, this region. Um, this is actually with our new model that's just started running, and it, there's been some changes in it that have reduced the bias. But this is, this, is, this is the whole period, and this is what the diurnal cycle of the bias looks like uh, between the model and the OB. So the bias is there. It's actually come down. And, and from the comparison, the UM is now at the lowest, having had one of the highest in our latest upgrade. It's, it's come down to some of the lowest, and we know why. And I can touch on that s slightly. But that's, that's, that's the bias in the five-day lead time over this spring period. You can look at the surface fluxes, and it's quite obvious that there is uh, this af in the afternoon. Uh, perhaps there should be a few more clouds around or something, and we're not getting them because the the dash line is the obs, and we're over egging the, the the shortwave radiation at the surface. Essentially, there's the obvious response of the uh, OLR there. Then uh, there's this massively complicated thing, which I'm just going to kind of say is massively complicated, but go through and categorize all the different cloud types using a high, medium, low. To, so when you try to tackle a model bias, you know, okay, so I've shown you a bias. That's not going to help me fix the bias. Which, if, if, if there's problems with the clouds, what types of clouds are leading to this bias? Um, and so there's this regime definition, and we've it's even split up into two, but there's seven regimes here, which are all the different mixtures of high and low cloud, fully deep cloud, and et cetera, from one to seven. And also sub split up into greater than less than 50%. You can pl produce some immensely complicated plots from all that information, uh, which I definitely won't have time to go through. But this is, this is the types of work you I take it is just the types of work you need to do to really begin to tackle the bias. So, what this is showing is all these different cloud types split up into the size of the, um, so the height of it is the frequency of that regime. So that you can see how often any of these regimes occur over the AM site in this six-week period, these different cloud regimes. And then the coding of it, the color coding of it shows the average error from those, from those regimes. And then we're beginning to say, well, actually, yeah, when the biggest biases are around, these types of things are going on, essentially. Um, and, and this is kind of basically where it's, where it's at at the moment, essentially. But you can then begin to sort of split it up and look at radiation biases for the regimes and, and, and all the other physical processes that might be linked in with the clouds and go split from high level, mid level, low level, and nighttime. And so the interesting one about the nighttime bias, uh, I have a theory on this actually, but I'm not going to tell you this. Uh, is, it, the, the interesting thing is that there's no one, there's no one regime contributing to the bias. It's these different heights of the bars are the frequency of those regimes, basically. But all the bars are colored pretty similar. And so you wouldn't pick out any one regime as contributing to this sort of 2.9k bias at night. So, so that, that work's ongoing, and there's been some changes made based on that work. But there's been some revision to the surface albedo. A one hour time step for the radiation has actually made a, a quite, we, we, we ran with a three hour radiation time step for several things. We did a clever thing with the clouds, but it didn't capture everything because radiation is expensive. But actually, a big big step came from putting a, a one-hour radiation scheme in into tackling this bias. Um, so this is HADGEM2, and this is a run with the new physics, basically. And we're, we're reducing the, the bias in our model from around 6, 7, down to more like 3, 4. So it's still there. It's not removed. But some of these changes have made quite a nice step to tackle that. You can see the same effect. It's about a 20% reduction in NWP forecasting. So this is a verification from the current NWP runs. Uh, there's also some aerosol changes gone in that have improved the temperature biases over Canada. And those biases have been broken down into the different physics changes. And that's the type of thing you need to do with all this work. So in summary, I, I rattled through that last bit, but there's lots of detail you can ask questions about if you want. You know, the Met Office and its modeling partners are committed to the seamless modeling system. And I've highlighted that both from the value in using it, but also the things we can learn from uh, 
in, in developing it from having it run across all these time scales. But it does provide challenges for model development. Um, when you want to change your physics now, when we, we, we upgrade the model once a year, and when it's upgraded, we've got to test it in seasonal prediction, climate prediction, NWP prediction, regional modeling prediction, and it's got to be better at all of them. And that's right hard, really difficult. Uh, and that's kind of a downside of this to, to, to some extent because it's hard to get changes in. So that balances the strengths of having all these ways of testing things. And I think yeah, definitely overall, the message is it's a good thing. But it's certainly hard to try and get lots of things to improve things over all time scales. But it probably tells you that the improvements that you make are really good ones if it improves it over all those time scales. Therefore, I, I guess just to finish then, you know, I've just shown you two examples. And that's it, thanks. Thank you very much, John. Good talk. Deserving of that long introduction. Yes. So uh, we certainly have time for a few questions. And this is being webcast and recorded, so we'll use the microphone. Uh, very comprehensive, John. Uh, I'd like to comment about this warm bias over the United States in particular, and also over continents. That error, or bias, is, is very consistent with the absence of propagating convective systems, MCSs, over continents, particularly the US. We've shown this in, you know, with various resolutions. And uh, I think it's something to focus on here, because we're getting to this now. Uh, in, in, in fact, with, with a 10 kilometer grid, you have some chance of permitting these things. Uh, one kilometer is needed to really resolve them. But I would suspect that these models there do not have any sign, or very little sign, of these propagating systems in summertime. That's absolutely right. So one, I mean, definitely one of the theories is these propagating MCSs as, and, and they have two impacts actually, that they obviously cut out the sun at the surface and impact the radiation balance like that directly. And they also rain. Yes. And that rain wets the ground and that controls the surface temperatures as well. Now, the analysis we've done so far hasn't conclusively pinned that down as being solely the problem. So it's a, it's a really good starting theory uh, and there's evidence that some of the convective scale models uh, which would capture these. So if you nest down, another test that we're about to look into doing and another experiment connected with this is to run a 2.2 kilometer model over the US, uh, possibly in a relevant period like this, whereby although the boundary conditions may have this bias in, it will propagate through MCSs because 2.2 will do that and we've seen that. Um, and see whether that uh, how big a, that tackles a problem. But there's been, you know, land's been implicated, some of the land surface aspects, irrigation. Yes. It's, it's not the only thing, but I do agree that they're important. Uh, I agree that it's not the only thing. Uh, uh, the, the cooling, the, the mesoscale scale dandruff, the, their cooling effects are enormous. For right. Yeah. Uh, okay, Roy, next after Peter here. Peter, hold on now. <laughs> Stadium. You touched on it at the end, but what do you think are the biggest disadvantages or problems with having a seamless uh, system through weather forecasting to climate? Um, well, beyond the one I said, sorry, I, what, what I said at the end was that you know it, it's a challenge to make improvements across all the all the different time scales, uh, and so I think it needs more work. It doesn't probably probably have more people working on model development in the Met Office than anywhere to get that, but the improvements are probably good. Um, there's challenges around things like, if you think about, you have to make pragmatic, you have to be, there's various points where you have to make pragmatic decisions. So um, the vertical grid, uh, seasonal prediction, you want a higher, you want a stratosphere, you want to resolve the stratosphere. We know the importance of the stratosphere in seasonal prediction. However, for short range, the data assimilation is not massively keen on a very high model top and, and can cause some, some problems. Um, so what do you do about that? And you, you have these kind of decisions to tackle uh, occasionally. Uh, Andy Brown wrote an interesting paper in Monthly Weather at BAMS uh, talking about the downsides of, of, of this. And th there were some of the areas that he touched on. But I, I'm absolutely convinced it's a good thing overall 
but but yeah it's not and it's important the way I stressed at the beginning as well that a seamless system isn't exactly the same convection is a challenge you know so, so what do we what do we do with convection sorry In principle, you might think that you do, uh, and in, when in actual fact, so I, I, I glossed over this, and this is a little bit complicated because um, it's complicated. The, what, what, what you do, you find that non-convective resolving scales. So, uh, twelve. You, you avoid scale. We avoid scales between about twelve and four. We don't go there. Beyond twelve, our convective parameterization pretty much. Functions the same across all time scales. We have a list of the different models. Space. Sorry, across all the space scales, we have a list of the different model setups for any configuration. And the only thing that changes from 12 to 200 or anything like that is the time scale that the convection works over, which is which is which is appropriate. We do it by hand, but it's it's, it's a traceable change. It, it, we don't make any other changes to that. And then when we go to four kilometers, we kind of switch it off. And just do shallow convection. Um, again, it's that's traceable and justifiable. Um, you could easily write some code that did that, but why? So, but yeah, th th that's another challenge. But we, we we also have a stretch grid on our 1.5 kilometer model, uh, but we don't stretch it. We, the stretch region is kind of there to just get things in. It's not like we look at it, um, and, and so it's not 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 important to us. But getting the physics to, to work across that. But again, we, we tend to just stretch it between four and one and a half, so it's fine. The cloud scheme, the cloud scheme is scale aware. Uh, the boundary layer scheme is scale aware. So it's not too bad, actually. I, uh, I wanted to just uh, comment on, on Mitch's uh, question to you. We, we have looked at this, Mitch, with a four kilometer resolution, and we had the same idea that, that you, you had, that this bias, which we get at 20 kilometers, could be resolved by going down to four kilometers. So we've run a full season, summertime. It, it, it helps a little bit, but it does not solve the bias. And, and we also looked at the land surface irrigation. It also does not solve the, the problem. So it's, it's, it's complicated. I'm starting to think it's maybe it's shallow clouds. Maybe even four kilometers are not capturing all the small scale clouds. So that's that, anyway, that's, I like to, to that's the preliminary results from this as well that we're seeing is, is that okay. you know it's not just those deep clouds that, that that seem to be linked to it. I think there's a minor flaw in this um, methodology at the moment that we need to tweak, but it's not it's it's fairly robust and it's not picking out just that as you might have hoped it was. So uh, John and, and and Graham Stevens and I are, are collaborating together. We have a postdoc that we're sharing, trying to get at this problem even more as part of this gas problem. That's right. And that, that, that was going to look at the convective scale as well. OK, one last question here. I'm going to pass the mic back. It's going to be a hard one. Yeah, well, uh, land schemes. Uh, like convection, there's a long history of elaboration and Baroque detail and so on. And I looked a few years ago at the surface albedo, and you know, the, a well-measured quantity that's crucial to the geophysical problem is just not matched because the plant functional type people want control yeah. over that. Yeah. Has anybody? Do you ever try a little pushback thing? Just make a bucket and sponge with the right albedo and some fitted curves, and uh, you know, <laughs> just get that land surface model out of there and replace it with a bucket and sponge. And how much? Could that, how far could you get with that? Let's say. Oh. I, I would might go even further than that and constrain, you know, to, we try constraining surface fluxes and things, but that, that decouples. So, so, so I think your mechanism is probably better in some ways, because if, if you prescribe the fluxes, because the arm side is quite good at, at observing the fluxes, but if you prescribe fluxes rather than allow the land to evolve, then it's quite a different simulation, because you're decoupling the land and the atmosphere. Um, so you Absolutely. I think it's a, it's a big, in fact, I don't know if you saw that the, the, the biggest change we've got in the bias so far has come from observational adjustment of the land, uh, of the surface albedo, basically. Yeah. So, so, so this, 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 this is basically showing that over there. This, this was the control run going through a forecast lead range, so sort of three hour averages, and these are the errors. 
uh, the obs area. So two warm comes down a big chunk with this new albedo, and that albedo is you know, it's come from the observations. So it's a tweak to the albedo, it's not an allowing to be too. Because don't forget, in the NWP model, the land scheme is more constrained, but there is data assimilation of the land as well. There's getting the moisture and things in there. So uh, I think the climate run, yes, but you see that it's in the very, very short range. And, and, and so that has tackled, it looks like the surface albedo, when you bring it down to something that's close to observations, it is, is about 20% of the problem in terms of the um, in terms of the short range, and maybe half the problem in terms of climate. All right. Well, with that, I'd like to thank all of you again for coming, and please join me once again in thanking John for a really nice talk.